The views and opinions expressed by participants in the following public affairs program do not necessarily reflect the position or beliefs of WDEF or its staff. Since 1954, this is Point of View, the world record-holding public affairs program produced at the studios of WDEF-TV Chattanooga and with underwriting community support. Hello, I'm Maurice Lewis and welcome to this edition of Point of View. We'd like to welcome my co-host Leslie Smith is joining us today, the first flight out. Co-pilot, co-pilot. Okay, Leslie, who do we have today? Well, today we have with us Ronnie Pruitt, and she's with the Urban League of Greater Chattanooga. And then we also have with us Assistant Chief uh, Dana Vaughn, and she's with the Chattanooga Police Department, and she's with the Recruiting Department there. So uh, we have a subject that's near and dear to a lot of people's heart, public safety. I want to start with you, Chief. Why on earth do you have a program to help pay for nominees for a job that has security, it has a pension plan, it pays well, but you're, you're still trying to pay people to come and join you. Why? We are. Um, our struggle is to um, get our uh, workforce to match our community that we serve, and that, that's been a struggle of ours for many years. Um, and although we do try to um, um, we try to strengthen our recruiting efforts. Uh, we took it one step further to see if we could do a little bit better, and we're now offering our community uh, money for sending us qualified recruits to join our police force. Well, this is a referral program like a yes, lot sir. of uh, employment agencies do, yes, sir. or real estate agents send me a customer, and if it works out, uh, I'll remember you. So, Ronnie, <laughs> you're here for, from the Urban League. How did you get how did the league get involved in this partnership? Well, we are the referring agency. Um, when individual job seekers come through our organization, we refer them over to the Chattanooga Police Department. And not only do we refer them, we also educate them on um, how to, what it actually takes to become a law enforcement officer. So we have an application, a software application tool that is used, and these individuals take an assessment test and they, it tests not only their skills and their interests, but it determines whether or not they would have the personality to even mm. become someone in law enforcement. And that's why, where we actually start with the referral based on the assessment results. Okay. So what are the numbers uh, as far as the minority numbers within the department? Currently we have around um, 450 sworn officers and only about 30% of those are minority. So obviously, uh, we would like to work a little bit harder to match our workforce. When you look at the whys and the why nots, what are some of the main obstacles that people don't want to become law enforcement officers? Is it the reputation? Uh, is it the fear of being uh, pigeonholed or ostracized by the community that would like for you to serve them? I think it's a number of factors. Um, I've, I've watched the the uh, environment change over the last 20 years that I've been in law enforcement and it has become considerably more dangerous since I started 20 years ago so I think that has a lot to do with it and you know Ronnie and I have been doing a lot of talking back and forth between our organizations and a lot of times people just don't they don't think they have what it takes to be a law enforcement officer so that's where we appreciate their partnership you know, coaching those kids and letting them know they, they do have potential to do what we do. Okay, has this program, has it worked so far? Have you recruited any recently through this program? We have a couple in the pipeline, and I just found out Miss Ronnie actually yes. uh, re uh, referred re one who's in the academy He's now. in the academy Look at that as big we smile. Yes. 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 All right. <laughs> yes, and we have a couple more in the pipeline, but we want we would really like to increase that we have yes. money to give away and we would really like to give the money away so Ronnie so. talk about some numbers uh, is it difficult to reach people with the premise of which you like to be a police officer yes it is pretty difficult I mean given the current environment but like I said earlier you know we use that software um, application to pretty much show them the day in the life of being an officer or just being someone in law enforcement. 
you know, and to see whether or not they can actually grow in the law, law enforcement industry. So um, it's all about education. Once they're educated and know, you know, what it actually takes to become a law enforcement officer, then they're they they little you know, a little more comfortable with it, those that are, of course, that have the personality to become a law enforcement person. Okay. Yes. Well, the, um, with the police department currently, um, what steps are you all taking in addition to the, the incentive program to recruit people within the community? Um, in addition to the Each One Reach One initiative, we also have a minority internship program um, it, it's kind of limited in the age. Uh, as long as you would turn 21 at the beginning of a next academy, you're eligible to enroll in that. But that's actually a paid position. Uh, we just opened up the application process for another 15 interns. Uh, we'll be selecting those soon. Um, and of those 15, if they choose to proceed with a career in law enforcement, they roll right into our academy. Once you know, it starts. there are individuals out there, and I've talked to a few individuals in the community. Uh, there are all white gentlemen who are ready to get into the mm -hmm. academy whenever that starts. And their question is, you know, why the preference? And one of the guys, uh, like, I have a law enforcement background, and I've always felt the person that's going to be my partner, I want them to be the cream of the crop, right. as good as I am, and better. So there's a perception out there that, you know, the standards are lower because there may be a quota. And uh, how difficult is that for you guys to uh, look at that, that problem and still d deal with morale for the officers that are in and waiting to come into the force? Well, I, I don't consider it lowering our standards at all. Um, I just consider it as uh, our attempt to uh, bring our law enforcement department uh, um, up to speed as far as matching the makeup of our community. Um, I. I we're always open for applicants, yeah. um, but like I said, if, if, if our goal is to uh, get our department to where it meets the community makeup, that's what we're striving to do. Well, over at the league, you guys try to reach young people way before uh, they are adults and gone. I mean, it's been an important thing for job training and yes. information and what have you. How young do you want to start to get this information out to young people that there is a career in law enforcement? Well, we get them as early as in high school. You know, um, I have a youth program, the Urban Youth Empowerment Program, in which we, ha we have individuals from um, 14 to 18 years old. So we, they're currently in, in high school. So we actually educate them through this software application tool as far as with a career and what to start thinking on, you know. And um, what Dana mentioned earlier, it, it's good that the community looks like them. I mean, as far as being an officer. So them representing um, their community is even more of a plus. So that's one of the things that we encourage in these young people that, you know, you may not, you know, look favorably upon police officers right now, but, you know, consider, you know, being that um, pillar in the community that can make a difference and become a law enforcement officer and be a positive um, a role person, model, role model you in your community. A change agent, Exactly. Actually. You know, Leslie, you and I talked about any number of other questions that we would have, but we've just gotten a sign of where a, a minute out or less. So will you please come back with us because there will be uh, sure. much more that we would like to talk about. Happy yes. To. All right, Ronnie, happy. Chief, yes, we'd like to thank definitely. you both for, for coming up. Thank uh, now, you. we know in the next segment we're going to be talking about uh, who would like to change Chattanooga. We'll have more when Point of View continues. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. Hello, thank you very much for continuing with us for this edition of Point of View. I'm Maurice Lewis, welcoming my co-host, Ruth Carter Hickman. Ruth, we've got something really exciting planned. And you know, when you look at our set there, you get an idea of what <laughs> Chattanooga looks like, but there's something else that's really getting ready to happen. Right, thank you. We're gonna introduce, we have two wonderful interns from the design studio here in Chattanooga. And they're with the Cityscapes program. We have Brianna Keith to my far right, and then right here next to me is Callie Hovey. Welcome, ladies, to the show. What are you guys doing here in Chattanooga? 
Um, well, this summer in Chattanooga, we're continuing the Cityscapes 2 project with Cityscapes 1 last summer, um, but we're continuing it into four other sectors into our project, and it's uh, devoted into the culture, um, building types, also infill, as well as streetscapes within Chattanooga. Okay, put that in layman terms for us. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, either of you. Um, well, I mean, starting out culture, I mean, do you want to go into that? Uh, yeah, so for culture, it's basically looking at the diverse relations within Chattanooga, trying to figure out um, what uh, cultures are within Chattanooga and how to bring them into the area more frequently. Okay, and so what have you found out about the cultures here in Chattanooga? Um, well, I found out that there is actually a lack of the Hispanic population down in Chattanooga. Um, they don't really have a place for them here in the downtown center. They're more so in Highland Park. So we want to, well, I want to try to figure out a place to bring Chattanooga, I mean, the Hispanics down to the area. Okay. And then your expertise? Tom? I'm actually looking at infill strategies. So I'm actually currently doing a study on each building downtown. Um, so I'm actually walking the streets, having to go to each building specifically. And I'm looking at um, how the exterior kind of relates to the sidewalk. And so does it activate, does it bring people to it, that kind of thing. Um, the condition of the building, so is it in good condition or is it in poor condition. The stability of it, so is it strong enough to keep you know, having for future use or is it something that needs to be reconsidered about uh, renovating. Or um, also looking about you know, how much room is the building actually taking up on the individual site. Is it using up the full potential of its site or is it not? And so from that, we'll be able to look at all these different opportunities for future development and that kind of thing. So looking at the future development opportunities of what's there and then what your goal is, what, uh, what was the impetus of why did you start this to, to see how could you bring other ethnic groups into the downtown area? Um, well, I wanted to do that mainly because there is a big gap within downtown Chattanooga. I feel like the white population is more so prevalent than African American or Hispanic. You feel like? <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> you know. I feel that. I, I go to the coffee shop. Okay, all let's over. see. We can dispense with the statistics. And, uh, okay, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the statistics, it's highly imbalanced. Um, I'd say that with the African American population, they have East Martin Luther King Street, and I think it's growing around there very well with the, the businesses that are going down, down there. Um, but as for, um, there's a huge amount of gentrification going down in the city as well, which kind of pushes out a lot of the cultural communities that are around Chattanooga. Mm. Now when you say gentrification, I know mm -hmm. some people, some of our viewers are like, what is that? <laughs> so what's the simple, how would you explain that? Um, I would categorize it as like local coffee shops or high-end retail areas that keep kind of growing into the downtown area. And so, the prices go up, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the simple <laughs> thing is, what's available to me that I can afford and do I feel welcome? So how do you guys address mm -hmm. that? I'm, I mean, I think it's kind of one of those things that goes back to the culture aspect. It's like, if you want to bring, you know, a bunch of people into the city, because currently nobody lives in the city. Everyone's kind of coming in to work. Yeah. So I think if we start providing, you know, housing that's affordable and things that are affordable for everyone in the surrounding areas to come in, then we'd see more of that culture and more of that stuff that we want to see. So that's kind of been the big emphasis that we've kind of seen working mm -hmm. is that they're trying to bring more housing that's affordable for everyone. Ruth, you and I both know one of the principal issues that we hear from everybody is parking and the price. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything gonna, uh, that you guys are developing that may help with parking downtown? I think it's actually kind of a funny topic because, I mean, coming from Atlanta, <laughs> I don't see an issue with parking. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I just kind of walk everywhere. But I think it's something that they're definitely looking at as far as addressing and trying to help the community out in that aspect. So, I mean, they're definitely trying to, you know, hear what's going on, and definitely receive that information and do with it as much as they can. I think mm -hmm. it's incredible that you both are, are so intelligent and are interns and on TV to speak <laughs> on behalf of your company. What's it like working at the design studio? Uh, do you want to go first? Um, it's really great. I'm always learning something new. Um, being in Atlanta, it's quite different because in Chattanooga, we're always walking around. We're always doing new things, walking around, meeting new people. And the amount of faces you see on the street all the time, it's more frequent than I ever thought was possible. So I love the closeness and the community within Chattanooga. Yeah, for me, it's like the best thing is like having all my friends, you know, text me like, oh, what are you doing in Chattanooga? I'm like, oh, well, this is what I'm doing. Like, oh, yeah, we figured you're outside all the time. <laughs> you know, I'm stuck at this desk drawing like, you know, toilets or something in CAD. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry. So, so what do yeah. people have to study so they can exactly. hang out outside and look at buildings? And what's what are your guys' majors? Uh, we're both in architecture. She's a year ahead of me. Mm -hmm. So, which I think is kind of interesting because urban design is kind of something they don't really 
I mean, they do push it, but it's kind of something they push to later years, so it's cool to get that. Um, what interested you in, I'm very curious, Maurice, well, uh, you know you should be. in urban design? Like, what, you know, what motivated both of you to, to study that? Um, I think what kind of motivated me is I, I really place a high priority on aesthetically pleasing places, but also one that gives back to the community as well. So having a good, uh, well-rounded aspect to that is playing with both sides and allowing a lot of the community to come in is crucial, I believe. Okay. There's the comfort level factor. People like to go where they can see someone that they identify with and subconsciously for communities of color or people from communities of color, this is a big factor in terms of why they don't go downtown. So it's a catch-22. I don't go because I don't see anybody that looks like me mm -hmm. and if I went I would see somebody that looks like <laughs> me. So how do you handle that problem? Um, I mean this kind of goes back to what you're doing is because she's highlighting you know places where there is culture and then being able to show, you know, this, it's absent here. Mm -hmm. So being able to place, because you're talking about that mocha lounge downtown. Yeah. That what was the last that? It, that was, was, it wasn't yeah. supported. I didn't get it to go. She was an entrepreneur. She had two great locations. Mm -hmm. People would not come down. Mm -hmm. uh, parking was one of the issues. Price of parking. People like to yeah. go to neighborhood places where you don't have to spend the extra 15 20 $30 in order to park. Right. Well, I heard that it was also um, really prevalent within the African-American community, but I think that just because it didn't reach out to the other parts of the community, it wasn't as successful because it didn't have more of that um, location coming in. I so are you saying that Chattanooga is still segregated? I believe so. I've been doing a lot of research on that, actually. I have looked at the racial dot map and found that a lot of um, the white community lives on the North Shore and the African-American community lives on the MLK district or in Southside. Hmm. Well, it, it's, it's an issue that has to be looked at b mm -hmm. because even though we have the younger people that are coming in are far more comfortable with being able to walk places, they are settling in the downtown area. So uh, parking for them wouldn't be a problem like you were mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are the main things now that you hope to accomplish and what's your timetable? Really, I think it's just drawing attention or like... Um encouraging people to understand or more of a like showing understanding from our viewpoint that we see that there's a problem and then kind of spreading awareness that you know this is something that the community needs to work you know towards to fix it as a whole so I don't mean does that would you agree or would you uh, yeah. say something differently yeah I certainly agree with that as well I think that the amount of people that can come into Chattanooga and benefit from what the city has to offer is lacking greatly. So I think that we should have a lot more people coming in to experience that. So our viewers that are watching that wouldn't get involved, how can they get involved with the design studio? We've got less than 15 seconds. Yeah. Um, well, we do have videos that we have every third Friday of the month. Mm -hmm. Just and so quickly give us a web address or a phone mm -hmm. number. Yeah, uh, website. Um, well, we're on 719 Cherry Street, and we can reach us at ChattanoogaDesignStudio.com. Awesome. So. Thank okay. you, ladies. Thank you both very much. We're <laughs> looking you. forward to having you guys back you. for a progress report. Well, listen, uh, is this a buyer's market or a seller's market? If you're interested in real estate, stay with us. We've got some information when Point of View continues. It's a short ride from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. Hi, thanks for staying with us as Point of View continues with Leslie Precup. You're back. We invited you back, and here you are. We have an exciting topic to talk about. If you're interested in real estate, is this a good time? But you have other questions you wanted to ask our guests. I do. Here with us today, we have Jeff Ramsey. He is a real estate agent with Remax. He's been with them for 17 years, correct? Approximately 17 years with uh, Remax here in Chattanooga. Well, you're also a broker as well as an agent. That was 03 that you've done this? Uh, I've been a broker for as long as I can remember. <laughs> it's a long time. Okay. Well, to start out, I know some of our viewers may have questions concerning being a first time home buyer. What, what are the difficulties that being a first time home buyer? home buyer will bring? Well, if, I'm not trying to self-promote here, but uh, there's plenty of... Oh, well, of please, <laughs> it's television. No, don't let that hold you back, okay? The, uh, there, there are plenty of really good real estate agents out there, but it's important to pick an agent that has some experience and knows what they're doing to help guide you along the way to keep you from making a poor decision. Um, I've come along to help sell a first-time home buyer's house so they were a first-time home seller, and they had 
made some purchases that I would have directed them away from, like master upstairs. It's hard to sell a master upstairs to anyone over 40, so you're cutting half your market out. Um, if your master bedroom is upstairs and the house is over $300,000, there's probably about 5% of the community that can actually afford that property. So you need some good guidance on your first home. Okay. And I know last year that the percentages fell below 4% for interest rates. And when 2017 started, they were way over 4%. Where does that stand now? Actually, I checked that today. Um, a 15-year fixed rate is going to run about 3%, um, give or take. Everybody's most everyone's shopping off the same pool of money. If you do a 30-year fixed, it's running around 4% today, which is fantastic. That's still awesome, yes. Fantastic. Is it a buyer or seller's market right now, would you say? It is absolutely a seller's market in Chattanooga right now. Um, for the last dozen years, I have seen our active inventory in the greater Chattanooga area, about 6,500 to 7,500 active homes on the market at any given time. Mm. Today, when I left the office, um, just a little over 2,800 homes available. So we're talking supply and demand. What's out there Absolutely. and how many people want it? Absolutely. Well, yeah. What are some of the best ways uh, that houses sell sooner than other houses sell? What, what do we look for? Sure. Um, staging the home, making sure that it's market ready, curb appeal, things of that nature. You don't want to put your home on the market and it not be in good condition. Paint the front door, trim the bushes, pressure wash the driveway, uh, make it look good because if you can't get the person out of the car into the home, they're never going to buy the home. I can't tell you how many times that I've pulled into a driveway and people it's like, oh, no, I don't, don't even want to go in. So curb peel, you got to get them inside. And then once you're inside, it's really important to have, you know, leave your lights on. If you know you have an appointment at 1 o'clock, somebody's going to come and see your house from 1 to 2, open all the blinds, turn on all the lights, drop the vanilla on the light bulb, make the whole house smell like cookies. <laughs> uh, it's the, those things are, just little things are very yeah, and, and put the pet bull away. <laughs> Absolutely, please. <laughs> so I don't get bit. <laughs> So uh, pricing, pricing is very important. Uh, people also look at schools. Yes. For, for first-time home buyers, we have a lot of those coming in. Now, when, when you first got this assignment, did you think it was going to be easy or difficult to be able to talk about what's necessary to buy a home? Both, because I myself am wanting to buy a house and I'm a first-time home buyer, and I've actually met with Jeff once before to discuss it, and there's so many little things that you don't think about that you need. You have to have two years of W-2s and uh -huh. this and that and everything, and it's just stuff you need to prepare for beforehand. Well, Jeff, I think one of the things uh, in certain communities that is a real hindrance for first-time home buyers, they may be well-intended people, but that credit score. Sure. Sure. Um, most loan programs are going to require a 680 or better in order to be eligible for government backed, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac type programs. Um, if your credit score is below that, then there are secondary markets, but the interest rate's going to be a little higher, down payment's going to be a little larger. You know, right now, if you do an FHA loan, you can get by with, you know, 3.5% down. And the median price in Chattanooga. Last year was about 170. Uh, this year it's about 181 because of that supply and demand. Well, that issue. goes right into mm -hmm. what you were saying earlier. You're looking at what's out there. How difficult has your search been for what you want? I'm very picky, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, this I'm is a lot princess. of money, right? <laughs> I'm the princess. I want I want the big closet and all the cabinets and all that. So it's a little bit more difficult, but I'm narrowing down what's most important currently. What are the three most important things for you? Easy accessibility to school and work is number one. And the other ones, they kind of, they change depending on the mood. Are you finding that more younger people, middle-aged people, or older people are turning to homes as opposed to apartments? That's a really good question. Um, I feel like all of them, really, I, I'm doing a lot of sales right now where people are downsizing. They mm -hmm. realize they have too much house, empty nest syndrome, the, the kids have moved out, and they need to sell their home and buy something a little bit smaller so it's more suitable for their needs. Um, people that are entering the workforce um, have become established and realize they're throwing their money away on 
rent when they Ooh. could be. Investing. When they could, yes. Yeah, they could qualifying be qualifying on that, yeah, right? They, they could be you know, putting some uh, toward principal, yeah. which, is, which is very important. So a lot of people, that's the biggest investment they'll ever make. And a lot of people, that's their retirement because if you do a 15-year fixed or a 30-year fixed and you live there for a long time, you pay that down. Even if you sell the home, you take the equity and you buy another home, um, you'll have equity in that home with your big down payment. And when you pay it off, um, that's retirement. Ashley, you had mentioned earlier that uh, you wanted to talk about the effects of what's happening in Washington, D.C. with the Trump administration. Yes. <laughs> they had, Trump's new tax plan, he actually wants to double the standard deduction. What might that, or how might that affect the housing market the, or buying a home? The deduction for the uh, mortgage principal interest. The, well, I'm actually wearing my RPAC pen. Uh, we have less than a minute. Understood. Well, that's a big question. <laughs> then, um, the mortgage interest deduction is, is, is huge. Um, RPAC, the Realtors Political Action Committee, fights every year to keep Congress and the Senate from cutting that out. That interest deduction um, really makes buying a home way more intriguing than being a renter. Well, Jeff, you are also president of the Greater uh, Chattanooga Area Realtors Association. President-elect. Uh, president-elect, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Same President. Way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, you have to come back with us. Actually, we have enjoyed having you here. You're going to be a regular on the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for now, having us. Now, some of the greatest boxes in history started when they were young. We'll have some examples of what's happening right here in Chattanooga on the next edition of Point of View. Closed captioning provided by the following. Funding for this program is brought to you by Barnett & Company, specializing in tax-efficient strategies for the preservation and distribution of family wealth, offering continuous investment management with a focus on long-term strategies. Areas of service include investment, estate, education, and retirement planning. Barnett & Company, the power of compound returns over time. More information can be found on the web at barnettandcompany.com.